Lord God, we just thank you so much for who you are. Uh, we thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. Just uh, what an amazing blessing it is just to be here at church today with you this morning to worship you. And Lord, we pray that as we look into your word this morning that you would uh, be speaking to us, that we would be receptive to hear and understand uh, the challenges and, and the encouragements that you have for us this morning. And then to be wor your words uh, speaking through me and not my own. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A question for you, or a couple of questions for you this morning. First one, what is the purpose of your life? The second one is what, it, what was the purpose of Jesus' life on the earth? This is what we will be looking at this morning. Uh, we've been looking for the last several weeks at uh, John's chap John chapter 11 and 12, uh, preparing ourselves, preparing our hearts for uh, the Easter, Good Friday and Easter celebration. Uh, last week, Pastor Tony was preaching from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. And uh, this week we'll be briefly looking at those verses in between, so 37 to 43, but we're going to be focusing primarily on uh, chapter 12, verses 44 to 50. So for those of you that are here two weeks ago, I preached on the passage at the beginning of chapter 12 of, the, of John's Gospel, where we saw Mary anoint Jesus with ex expensive ointment on his head and feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And so going from that passage to where we are today, there's many things that have transpired with Jesus. There was the triumphal entry, the Palm Sunday, which we celebrate uh, this morning, uh, where, when he entered Jerusalem and was worshipped. Then from there it was told that there were some Greeks, there were some Gentiles seeking Jesus, that they wanted to see him, they wanted to hear from him, and Jesus speaks of his coming glory and his eventual death. And from there it is mentioned that even with the many signs and wonders that Jesus performed and the many words that he had spoken, there were still many of the people that did not believe. And if you look at those verses there, uh, there's quoted from both Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah 53 as the people's unbelief fulfilled the words from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. For both these passages in Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53 spoke of the people that would hear the words and not believe, and that the Lord had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. And also in the book of Isaiah, even though there will be those that will not believe, there is yet mention of a holy remnant that will remain, even though many will choose to reject the word of God. And it's important to realize that as these words are in the Gospel of John, that these words spoken by God through the prophet Isaiah were not only applicable to the people of his time, but speaking also into the future when Jesus would be on the earth, as mentioned in John chapter 12. For even with the words that Jesus had spoken, the miracles that he had performed, the many signs and wonders that he had done while on the earth, there were still many who did not believe that he was the Son of God and the Savior that had been promised. But as there was in the days of Isaiah, there was a, still a holy remnant in Jesus' day as there were disciples and, and dedicated followers that remained close to him, even though many did not believe. Two weeks ago, we heard about one of them being Mary, who was a dedicated follower of Jesus. It says, if you look in John chapter 12, verse 42, that many even of the authorities believed in him, many of the elite, many of the leaders, but they feared the Pharisees and the other leaders, and they didn't want to be expelled from the synagogue, so they would not publicly admit their belief in Jesus of Nazareth. As it says in verse 43, they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. It was the same thing seen in previous chapters. The reason that they were wanting to kill Jesus and Lazarus, since they saw the people believing and following, and they cared more about the power that they had as leaders than what God was truly doing. And now here we, we see the others who cared more about the glory from man more than the glory from God. But while we might be quick to judge them for their actions, do, do we ever get caught up in that trap? We need to consider that ourselves. Do we ever care more about the glory that comes from man than the glory that comes from God? 
So that's a quick, real quick summation, brief look at those verses 37 to 43. Now we're going to really dig into uh, verses 44 to 50. So read those together with me again. John chapter 12, verses 44 to 50. So coming out of that context, it says, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So this is the passage that we're going to be focusing on this morning. And before we dive right in, I just love how Bruce Milne summarizes this passage in his commentary on the book of John. So we'll start there. What he said is, This paragraph sounds many of the primary notes of Jesus' message. First, Jesus has been sent by the Father and fully obeys Him. Secondly, Jesus is uniquely one with the Father. To see and hear Him is to see and hear the Father. Thirdly, Jesus is the light of the world. To come to Him and believe in Him is to receive the light of salvation. Fourthly, to reject, to reject Jesus means choosing to stay in darkness and to face future judgment. Fifthly, this judgment will be by the words Jesus has spoken because they are the Father's very words. And sixthly, conversely, to follow Jesus' words brings eternal life. So now we're going to focus in on this paragraph, this passage, verses 44 to 50, first lurking at verse 44. So after hearing that Jesus had left the crowds, and then hearing the words from Isaiah that we looked at, where it was foretold that many would see and hear Jesus and not believe, now Jesus speaks to those left around him. It says that he cried out, Whoever believes in me believes not in him, or not in me, but in him who sent me. Or at least that's what it says in my translation. And it's helpful to understand what he says here by seeing it as, he believes not only, not ultimately in me. So it's not saying that they don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in him as well as the Father, for Jesus was God, as the Father and the Holy Spirit are God. He is part of the Trinity, so to believe in Jesus is to believe in the fullness of the Godhead and the Father who sent his Son. So he continues on in verse 45, Whoever sees me sees him who sent me, as we have said. The Father that sent Jesus. And those that have been with Him and those that have seen Him have seen the Lord. They have seen the fullness of God dwelling in bodily form. And they hear these controversial words. Controversial for those who still refuse to believe that this Jesus of Nazareth that they knew could be proclaiming Himself to be God. These were very controversial words. But we know this to be the truth, that Jesus was both 100% God and 100% man. Now, this may not make mathematical sense for 100% plus 100% doesn't really work, but that's okay. Our finite human brains will never fully understand this side of heaven, the essence of Jesus, that he could be 100% God and fully man, and that's okay. We don't need to fully understand to believe and to walk by faith, trusting the words of Jesus. But we need to just understand that to see Jesus is to see God, for Jesus is God. That is the simple truth. The fullness of God is in Jesus, in the Father, and the Holy Spirit, who now dwells in the believer. For the last couple of weeks with the youth, we've been journeying through the book of Romans and we've been speaking a lot about the Holy Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where Paul says, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. 
And after we read that verse, I asked the youth to take a moment to really think about that reality that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That same spirit dwells in us. Do we believe this? And more importantly, do we live our lives lives as if this were true, that that same spirit lives in us? For this should, or rather this must, affect how we live our lives, how our Christian walk is, and how we view the Holy Spirit in our lives. But my point in it is this, that it's okay to not fully understand these things. The Trinity, Jesus' humanity and deity, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, that we're not going to ever fully understand these complicated truths about God, yet we can continue to learn more. But to understand that the Holy the Trinity can be three distinct persons, and yet all three fully God, yet different persons. But allow yourself to truly sit, to truly ponder, to just be in awe of who God is, of who the Father is, who Jesus is, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us as believers. And just sit and be in awe of what an amazing God we serve. If we took more time to ponder this, to truly sit and ponder this, to understand the power of God working in us, I believe our lives would look radically different. For are we walking by the Spirit moment by moment, day by day? Are we seeking God moment by moment as we live our lives? Do we believe in the power of God to change people's lives? Do we believe that God could work through us to change another person's life for eternity? More important, or do we also believe that He can change us? Do we believe that He can make us more like Himself? Do we want to allow ourselves to be changed by God? Perhaps we need to take time to seriously think on these questions for ourselves. So we now come to verse 46 where we see the theme of light and darkness. A prevalent theme throughout John's Gospel, if you're familiar with the book, you can see it in many different places. This theme is introduced right at the beginning of the book in chapter 1, if you want to turn there. In chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we see this theme of light and darkness being introduced. And it goes on further than just 4 and 5. So John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If you've ever been in the youth room, you might have seen that verse on our wall with our theme as lighthouse, just thinking of the light of Jesus shining in the darkness of the world. Those who were once in darkness have been brought into the light so that they may not remain in that darkness. If you look at John chapter 8, again, it references light and darkness. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then again in John chapter 3, After this famous verse, John 3.16, in verses 19 to 21, we see that it further develops the idea that people love the darkness, uh, for they can remain hidden, and their works are hidden, for they do not want to be exposed to the light. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, for they are doing good and not evil things that should be hidden. Again, Jesus is the light of the world. You can even think of this practically as well. For most crimes are committed under the cover of darkness, of night, so that their evil deeds and their crimes are unseen. For if a light was shone on them, their crime would be exposed. In the same way, many do not want their sin to be exposed by Jesus, the light of the world. Perhaps you have heard this from a non-believer. I know I have. That they say, well, I wouldn't want to become a Christian because then I would have to give up Whatever it is, fill in the blank, partying, drinking, whatever it might be, having fun. Or they know that if they were for they know that if they were to follow Jesus, to surrender their lives to Christ, their deeds performed in darkness would be exposed to the light. But this isn't meant to just be seen as a negative thing. 
but positive, for as Jesus phrases it, that they might not remain in darkness. That is, it is a good thing to come to the light, to not remain in darkness. For if you can be in the light, if you can dwell in Christ, in the light of the world, why would you want to return to living in darkness? As I mentioned, this theme of light and darkness introduced from John 1 right through the book, life is light. So in the light, there is life. So if you look at the other side, then in the darkness, there must be death. If light is life, then darkness must mean death. Think of how hell is described. We don't have time to read through all the different verses, but in Matthew chapter 8, and also in chapter 22 and 23, it is described as an outer darkness. In 2 Peter chapter 2, it speaks of being cast into hell and receiving chains of gloomy darkness. And in Revelation 20 verse 3, it is described as a bottomless pit. So it's clear from these verses that to be in the light is good, but to remain in the darkness is bad, and that the ultimate death will be in darkness. So after looking further into this theme of light and darkness throughout the book of John, we now come to verse 47, where it says, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So here Jesus says that he did not come to the earth as a human ultimately to judge the world, but he came to save the world. He was the promised Messiah to come as Savior for all. He came, he spoke truth, and he would pay the ultimate price for our sins to be crucified, as we will remember on Good Friday coming up this week. But it's important to remember that there will be a time that Jesus will come to judge the world, but this was not his first coming. This will be in his second coming, which is also spoken of earlier in John's Gospel. So we're going to look at John chapter 5, verses 19 to 29. John 5, 19 to 29, which speaks on his second coming. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life, to, gives life to whom He will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to ex execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So I hope that as we read through these verses that many of them sound familiar, for there is many parallels between uh, verses 44 to 50 of chapter 12 and this section here in chapter 5. There's many similar themes and similar things that Jesus is saying. Just some context for uh, these verses in chapter 5. Jesus was in Jerusalem for a feast uh, or a festival. He had just healed a man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. So it was uh, controversial to do a healing, to do work on the Sabbath. Uh, so he spoke to the leaders and the authorities of the authority that he had to be doing this healing on the Sabbath. As Jesus says in John 12 that we've been looking at, his authority came from the Father. And he does what he sees the Father doing. Or as he says in John 12, he says only what the Father has told him. 
So this shows that while the three persons of the Trinity are all fully God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is still a supreme authority that God the Father holds. The other thing that is seen in this discourse in uh, John chapter 5 is that the Son will give judgment. As it says in verse 22, that the Father has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus also says how to avoid judgment. For he says in verse 24, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And then verses 27 to 29 speak of a time when Jesus, the Son of Man, will execute judgment. And all the dead will face judgment, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So even though this speaks of a time when Jesus will come as judge, what he says in John 12 is not a contradiction with these verses where he says that he did not come as judge, but rather when he speaks of coming as a savior, it is his first coming on the earth. And when he comes as judge, it is his second coming when he will return as judge. So just to understand that there's no contradiction there, but it's speaking of different times. So now looking at verse uh, 48, it works in close step with verse 24 of chapter 5 that we just read. As it says there in, in verse 24, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And now in verse 48 it says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So, if those who hear and believe will receive eternal life, then it makes sense to say that those who hear the words of Jesus and do not believe will not have eternal life. Again, just looking at one, both sides of the same coin. In fact, as it says in verse 29 of chapter 5, they will not, they will not receive eternal life. Instead, what they will receive, what they will face is the resurrection of judgment for their lack of belief and choosing not to receive the words of Jesus. And this is exactly what Jesus says here in verse 48, that the word that he has spoken will, will serve as judge on the last day. So the question for us as we think on this, as we read this, as we understand this is, will you receive and believe his words? Will you receive and believe them, or will you choose to refuse and to reject the words that he has spoken? So now we've come to the end of this passage in verses 49 and 50. And as I briefly said before, as we looked at John chapter 5, Jesus' authority comes from the Father. He does not speak just from his own authority, but what is given him by the Father. And not only here it says, not only has the Father given Jesus authority, but, but He has given Him a commandment of what to say and what to speak. And as it says in verse 50, this commandment is eternal life. Again, as Jesus said in John 5, whoever hears His word and believes in the Father will have eternal life. So this is the commandment. This is the eternal life that He speaks of. Jesus came as Savior to proclaim how we may receive this promised eternal life. So the question for us is, what will we do with His words? Will we choose, again, will we choose to believe and receive the words of Jesus? And will we not just keep these to ourselves to save ourselves, but will we share His words with those around us? And as we come to Easter, as we remember Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, will we not only just look at these at Easter season, but will we remember the significance of those moments each and every day? And will we care more about what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ thinks of us, or will we care more about what others think of us? If you remember at the beginning, the people that cared more for the glory of man than the glory of God. Again, Jesus came to save the world. That was his purpose. That was his message to offer eternal life. So if he is your Lord and Savior today, 
What is your purpose and what is your message moving forward from this day forward? I pray that we may think and we may pray upon these things as we approach Easter and beyond those days as well. So let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for just what you have for us, Lord, to, to be able to take the time to look at your life, to look at the words that you have spoken, the eternal life that you offer us freely, Lord God, we just are so thankful. Now I pray that moving forward from this day, we would continue to reflect, Lord, on the sacrifice that you paid, on the life that you offer us, and what that means for us, and also as we interact with those around us, Lord God. So we just thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen.